Sorry for that delay. Um, so today we welcome you to session two, which is history of art. And it's going to be Helena who's going to take you through this session today. Um, I really hadn't experienced any of this sort of knowledge when I was at school, and I'm sure that's the same for the most of you. So what I hope you'll do is come away with a set of sort of skills and ideas that will help you appreciate all sorts of art all the more in the future. So, Helena, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Helena and I'm a fourth year PhD student in history of art um, here at Oxford. And I've done most of my education in history of art. Um, so I'm going to take you through today a bit of a workshop where we're going to have a bit of discussion about what history of art is and we're going to do um, some visual analysis together. So it's going to be quite an interactive workshop. So I would really like to hear from you guys in the chat. Um, so really just tell me your opinions and things like that. There's not really any right answer throughout this workshop. So please just share your thoughts with me. And um, yeah, it's so exciting to have you here and I hope uh, you'll enjoy the session. Um, so the structure of the workshop is that first we're going to think about what is history of art. Because um, just like many of you, I didn't really know what history of art was before I came to uni either. So we're going to think about that. Then we, I'm going to talk about why we love history of art, why it's such a great subject, why it might be interesting to look at art. And then we're going to do visual analysis, which will be, oh, someone is saying in the chat, I love art. OK, that's great. That's like the that's such a good starting point to have. Um, and then for the majority of the time, we're going to have visual analysis. Uh, which is going to be really fun where we're going to look at some uh, art and you're going to help me figure out what this is all about. But um, yeah, I think we're off to a great start. We have someone who loves art, which is a is a great foundation. Um, and then, OK, let's get started. So now I want to start with here from you. What do you guys think history of art is? And here there's not really any wrong answers either. So you can tell me what do you think it is? What do you think it not is? It might even say it a bit in the word itself, right? Someone is saying in the chat, um, art. Um, yeah, tell me, what do you think? What do you think an art historian does? What, how might it be different from um, what a historian do? Art from history, someone is saying. Yeah, that's very true, great and simple. Uh, yeah, um, we do look at art art throughout history, right? So someone is saying in the chat as well, how art changes over time, which is a really good point. So we look at quite an expansive timeline of all the art that's been created throughout time. And we can see when we have that very expansive look, we can see how art has changed, right? So. The art of the medieval period is very different com for contemporary art. So we look at that, we see how things have changed. Um, OK, so many of you in the chat. This is great. Um, let me see. Um, um, influenced art from a certain period. Yeah, so often we as art historians will will focus on a particular period that we're that we're really excited about. That could be, again, contemporary art. It could be something like modern art, really anything. Maybe you heard about the Renaissance. It could be something like that. So yeah, we like to categorize art in terms of when they were made. Um, the history of art is art from across the world throughout the centuries, even back to cave paintings. That's a really good reply. Yeah, um, completely true. And I really like your comment about across the world. I think that is really important and it becomes, it's become more and more important in art history as a discipline to think about not only European paintings or Western paintings, but think about contemporary East Asia art, think about Thai art, think about Latin America, really think about art across the world. So super important. And even back to cave paintings. Yes, and that's true too. It's super expensive. Um, it's about artists and the context behind the pieces. 
Yeah, so that goes actually back to what we talked about, how art influence, it sort of changes across time, right? Because here it's where the context comes in that the art is always responding in one way or the other to the context that's happening around them, right? Whether it be politically, whether it be socially, culturally, whether it be the materiality that is available, you know, art never exists in a vacuum. It's always responding to something. So that's a really good point. Um, the evolution of art over time, again, such a good one uh, completely. And I think actually that's one of the nice things about art history is that we get that idea of how art has changed and is still changing. Um, art from history, the origin and meaning of art styles and specific pieces. Yeah, that's interesting. So actually thinking about something like styles and something about, you know, having, we can see that there is some art that looks very similar. We can see there's a group of artists that's interested in similar things. And that's where we then think about, okay, well, what style was this? Oh, they're using very thick paint or something. Okay, well, that's a kind of style. So yeah, super good. Um, I think an art historian uh, try to interpret what certain artworks might mean. Yeah, that's completely true. And that's what we're going to do. So our job is really to try and figure out, well, what does this mean, this work? Does it and what does it mean to me, but also what does it mean to the people of the time when it was made? Uh, how art evolved over time, again, really good one. The progression of styles and techniques due to the time period. So that's a really good one as well, because as I said before, all art is created within, within, within a time and a context, right? And that means that, for example, before the Industrial Revolution, a lot of the pigments that artists used, right, something like red or blue, was made from natural ingredients. So that means that it was made from insects, it was made from plants, it was, you know, it was something that was grinded and natural material. Whereas with the Industrial Revolution, we also have the Chromo Revolution, which meant that suddenly color that means pigments could be made in the laboratory. And that means that that was the invention of synthetic pigments. Um, and suddenly artists had this big new palette of colors that they could use, like deep purple, bright orange, a nice yellow, all sorts. And that's something we don't think about today, right? Because we everything is bright colored today. But actually, we have to remember that the artwork before the Chroma Revolution will be very different. Oh, now I think maybe my PowerPoint went away. Do you guys still see my PowerPoint? We can still see it. Yeah, we can still. Oh, you can still see it. OK, uh, let me see. Um, that's weird. Hmm, two seconds. Did you want to stop it and reshare it, Helena, if you're having a problem? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to do that. Let me just see. I'm so sorry. I don't know why it's acting up today. Okay. Um, I'll try. I'm trying to re-upload it, and then we'll see how that goes. Um, yes, but we're talking about art. I was talking about color. Um, and all of you have so many great responses. Uh, where did I get to? The detailed view of art from different time periods. Yes, correct. Oh, here we go. Let's see. Do you see it now? Yes. Yes, great. Okay, we're back on. Um, 
how society developed alongside with art. That's a really interesting one as well, because that's a really good comment in terms of how society is also impacted by art, right? That the art also have an influence about what is happening. Um, so yeah, really good. Um, and then someone is saying how art started with Picasso. I think that is quite a controversial comment, actually. I think art started much before Picasso, but it's a good, I'd like to hear your argumentation for it and why you think that, why it all started with Picasso. Picasso was a very, for you people who don't know him, he was a very, he was a modern artist and he was quite new in the way he did things. But lots of people came before him, but it's true he invented something new in art, I think. Um, and then someone is saying, I think history of art talks about the cultures that inspired different artworks and how it developed over time. Yes. So that thing about you're all really catching on to this thing that the art exists within a context, it exists within a culture, and it's something therefore that develops over time. Art is not static, it doesn't look the same across time. It's something that we can see changes, right? If any of you have ever been to a museum, you can see, OK, well, in some of the rooms, the things look different, right? Uh, not just because of the medium, but because something else was going on, because the society was different at the time it was made. Um, and someone has asked me, where does a history of art degree take you? And that's a really good question. I'll answer all sort of questions like that in the end. So if you have any, just put them in the chat and I'll answer them in the end, but I'll keep moving for now. Um, great. OK, you all have a quite a good idea about what history of art is, I think. There is something you definitely all sort of have an idea. So that's really good. Um, so why we love history of art here at Oxford is um, lots of time with images, right? So what we do is, is spend lots of time with objects, with paintings, with images of different kinds, with textiles, really any kind of objects. And that means that the work that we're doing is visiting museums and galleries, uh, which, because that's a really good way for us to see the artworks up close. So here in Oxford, we'll often be going to the Asmolean Museum or the Pitt Rivers Museum or something like that, just really to get a sense of, okay, well, the object actually exists outside of the screen. Right. The artwork is only the beginning. And I think some of you already know this in terms of thinking about the context. And I think in order to understand the art object, we need to think about lots of other things. So that's always our starting point. But then we'll go on to think about how did the context look? How did what did the artist? Who was the artist? What kind of environment did they live in? All these sort of things. So we'll always have a much bigger journey to go on um, after the artwork or with the artwork. Um, directed by your own interest. Yes. So I think art, because there's so much to pick from, is very easily directed by your interest, which is really nice, right? So you can definitely pick what kind of art you like and then study that further, particularly if you go to university and do it. Uh, very much directed by your in own interest. It's the same if you go to a museum, you go to the to the art that you find interesting, right? Everything visual that humans have ever made really expansive. Yes. So just like with history, we really look at all kinds of art. So one of you mentioned cave paintings, right? It's all the way from cave paintings, thinking about archaeology, thinking about um, you know, cave paintings within that context, all the way up to contemporary art and digital art and things like that. Uh, the best thing, and I think this is something that I think a lot of art historians love this about art history, is that how many different ways you can look at the same image. And I think we'll see that later because uh, when we're doing our visual analysis, because we will all look at these images very differently. And I think because our history is something that's so reliant on vision, right? It's something that we're seeing and we're spending a lot of time looking. That means that it will always be subjective, right? It will always be something personal because I might see a painting different than how you see it. So that's super important. And it's something in art history that we take seriously that we as viewers will be different, right? Um, 
this is really exciting, I think, to actually understand that experience you have with an art piece. Um, multidisciplinary subject. I think that is another key thing about art history. It's a key thing about lots of humanities degree in total, I think, is that it's very multidisciplinary. So in our work, we will draw on philosophy, we'll draw on literature, biology, um, chemistry, you know, to understand pigments, we'll think about language, all these sort of different things, all to understand the art object. And that's really what we're saying with the, the artwork is only the beginning, is that we're drawing on so many different things to make sense of what's in front of us. Um, so yeah, uh, that's why we love it. I hope that was a bit convincing. Um, OK, so now we're going to go into another thing, which is skills of an art historian. So I think a lot of the time, particularly humanities degrees suffer under the idea that, you know, where does that degree take you? Can you get a job? What do you even learn? Is it a bit of an unserious subject? Um, and of course, that's all false. Um, it's very untrue. And I think as an art historian, you develop different skills, and this is just four of them. Um, but you, after a degree with history of art, or you really have a lot of transferable skills, as it's called, you have lots of skills to offer whatever career you might decide to go into. And I think the good thing about art history as a degree is that you don't really need to know anything beforehand, right? So. I didn't know anything about art history when I started. A lot of people, you know, don't grow up going to museums all the time. And that's fine because when you start at university, that's really where you learn it. Um, and I think so it's really a place for building up your skills as an art historian. Um, yeah, so we will do visual analysis first, which is the most fun one. So analyzing visual material. So we talked about how we look at so many different objects, right? We look at all sorts of different art, as mu much of you, as many of you are saying, across a wide span of time. And that means that we always have to be really good at analyzing visual material, whatever that might be. And that means that we're spending a lot of time with the art and we're taking it seriously as an art object. So we're actually spending time with it and trusting that the artist is doing something interesting, if that makes sense. So most people, when they go to museums, right, they spend five seconds in front of an artwork and then they go on to the next one. You know, you just sort of glimpse at it and you think, oh, that's quite fun. Then you move on. But actually, as art historians, we do the opposite. We can spend a lot of time, some people years, with the same paintings, with the same sculptures, with the same kind of objects in trying to understand what's going on. And when we are analyzing and looking at and trying to understand these objects, we often think about it in terms of three stages. So we have observation, which is sort of the first one, right? You see an art object and you think, okay, you look at what is this? Is it, you know, how big is it? Uh, what is it made out of? Uh, do I know who made it? Um, what kind of colors? Uh, is there any figures? Is there any animals? Is there completely basic questions like, what am I seeing? Then the analysis take us further and been like, mm, why am I seeing this? Is there something in the scene that tells a story? Is there something that doesn't quite make sense? So that's where we go on and be like, okay, well, why? Hmm, there's something that's looking maybe a bit weird. Why could he have used these colors before? So going even deeper to thinking about why and how. And then interpretation, that's when we then say, okay, well, I think the painting, the art object, the textile, whatever it might be, is looking like this because, right? So that's where we have an opinion about the piece. And that's where um, you're allowed to put forward your argument about it based on your observation and your analysis. So now we're going to do this. 
And of course, when you're doing this sort of three stages here, they seem, you know, there are three stages, but they go very, they interact with each other, right? So the more you do it, the more fluid this process becomes. But we're going to try and do it now with uh, two pieces. So I really want to hear from you. Um, and as I said, there's no wrong answers and we all see something differently, right? So, um, so yeah, and there's not really any, you don't need to know anything is what I'm trying to say. I don't require you to know something about this painting. Don't go on and Google it. I know some of you might have looked at it at home uh, before this. So I know you might all have something to say. So I'm really excited if you spend those five minutes in front of it thinking about it at home. That's really great. If you haven't, that's completely fine too. All of you just tell me, yeah, what have you written down about this piece? What are we looking at right now? What kind of object is it? What do you notice first? Um, yeah, let's just take it very basic. Um, and as I said, you don't need to know anything beforehand. I don't need any historical knowledge from you. Only It's only a task of what are we seeing? And you can just, yeah, put your answers in the chat. Let's see. Um, I like the big dresses and the dog. Yes, that's interesting. So immediately we're seeing a big dress, right? We're seeing big dresses actually, and a dog right in the foreground of the painting. Great. Uh, painter in a painting is fairly simple, but quite interesting. OK, interesting. So, yes, I think he might be a bit hard to see maybe on screen. But yeah, on the left side, we have a painter. And a painter in a painter. Yeah, it's definitely something we've seen before, right? You could call it simple. It might be quite interesting. And why we can see it as interesting is maybe. Well, it's a bit odd, maybe that the artist is there, but we'll go on to that. Good. Someone has noticed a painter. The two figures in the window mirror. Yes. So all the way on the back, just above the girl's head, we actually have a mirror with two figures in it. Great. Uh, I noticed a dog at the front. Yeah. The man behind. So maybe that's the guy going up the stairs. Um, and yes. So the, the man behind, if that's the guy you're referring to, is the man going up the stairs. Yes, that's right. I think he's really interesting, actually, because often we think of a painting as two dimensional, right? It's, it's flat. But actually what the artist here is doing is to allude to a reference, a room that sits, you know, beyond the painting. There's a third room that we not, don't have access to. So really good. Someone's saying it's a painting, and that's completely right. It's a painting, it's an oil on canvas. Yes. Mini humans. Great. So we definitely have uh, a young girl, right? We have someone who is a young girl, definitely. Um, then someone is saying, one of the things that interested me about the painting is the object in the foreground on the left. It looks to me like another painting that is being worked on. I want to know what is that painting? Does it relate to the scene we can see or is it something else? Yes, this is a really good question. Thank you. So definitely. So the artist, we have the artist at the left side. So he's standing with his palette, right? So he has a lot of different colors on his palette and he's standing in front of a canvas. So what we so that object is actually the back of a canvas, which we don't see very often, but it's the back of a painting. So he is working on that. Um, and definitely, as you're saying, is a is a different painting being worked on. And you want to know what is that painting? That's a really good question. And I think maybe we'll come back to that. 
Um, and I think it definitely relate to the scene that we're seeing, right? It cannot because it's in it. So the artist is definitely doing something very deliberately here in terms of putting his process of making, making a painting into the painting. You know, he's sort of, it's sort of a double reference, basically. Um, I noticed that there's lots of frames, someone says. Yes. So it's a very tall ceilings, right? So we have lots of paintings around the room. And I can tell you that that's actually the artist. That's the artist's own painting. So what I will reveal here is that the guy painting. That I just talked about with his palette. He's also the artist of the painting that we're looking at, right? And he is also the artist of the paintings hanging around the room. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Uh, the person in the background holding the door. Yes, so that's that guy going up the stairs, holding the door, looking back at us. Really interesting. I noticed the dim lighting at the back and the bright light at the front. Great. So we definitely have different spaces in this painting, right? We have a front here, as someone's saying, where it's very lit up. The girl is bright. She's dressed in white. And in the back, it's much more dim. So we have a clear foreground and a clear background. Really good. And the artist is really playing with the light here. It's completely true to create those spaces. Uh, interesting how it is a painting which shows another painting being painted. Yes, so that was what I was just saying. And please tell me more about why is that interesting? That Why is that unusual? Uh, the lighting is realistic. Yeah, so he's using natural lighting sources, right? It comes from the window, it's shining in, comes a bit from the door behind. Um, yeah. Um, someone is saying, I think the artist decided to use dark colors in the background to enlighten the little girl at the front of the painting. One thing that catches my eye is the man in the doorway as it seems to be lightened up. Yes, really true. So again, you're catching on to this sense of light and how important that actually is for a painting and how it maybe shows what the artist decides to put focus on as well, right? So he definitely wants us to notice the little girl. He definitely wants us to notice the guy walking up the stairs, right? You're saying it catches your eye, and I think that's completely true. Uh, someone kicking the dog. Uh, yes, the little girl. They're definitely, I don't know if he's being kicked the dog, but he's definitely, the dog is definitely there. Animal abuse. I mean, yes, um, I mean, that's correct. I mean, I think at this time they probably had another sense of, yeah, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. But um, yeah, true. There's something about the dog as well. It's interesting that the dog is even there in a painting, right? Um, there's more paintings in the background and under the lights on the ceiling. Yeah, really good. So that again is the paintings we're talking about. And interesting, yeah, that he has a light in the ceiling, but he's decided not to use that. So it's all natural lighting. Um, someone is saying it's interesting to see how the how the society standard has changed from that time, from the main focus of the children who are forced into being adults. Yes, that's true. So we have very, you know, the adults or the children, specifically the little girl, are definitely being treated like an adult, right? So she is, um, she's being taken care of. She's dressed in a very, uh, you know, nice dress. Some of some is saying below, the children are like are likely upper class as the dresses are fancy and intricate. Yes, completely true, right? So. We have a, a child that's dressed in very nice dress. She has her maids of honor, which is basically her servants that are fussing around her. And she is the main subject of this painting completely. And I really like this comment about it being upper class. That's right. So it's actually royalty. So the little girl is a princess. 
Um, so this is really sort of, you know, as upper class as it gets. So it's very rich. And I like how you're noticing that through the clothes, right? There's a there's a sense here that the clothes is like it's almost like textual. Um, I need to sneeze. <laughs> um, it's textual, it's shiny. Sorry. Um, you can almost see how it's like, how it's so nice, right? Um, then someone is saying, which is a really good response, um, the painting just makes me curious if we're interpreting this as a freeze frame of life, there's multitudes of interpretation of what's really happening. Why is that man leaving? Why are they not all looking directly forwards like we expect? Yeah, that's a really good comment. I like it. I think this is exactly what I'm feeling with this painting as well, is that it's something that makes me curious. There's different kinds of looking in this painting, right? There is someone, the man looking behind, someone looking at us, the maids of honor looking at the little girl. There's all these different kinds of situations going on, which I think is really interesting. And then um, I think what is also really interesting, and none of you have really pointed this out, but I think it's in what you guys are all saying is that there's lots of action going on, right? If we're thinking about this as a royal portrait, a portrait of a very upper class people, it's very different than what we might expect, right? So often when we think about royalty, it's very stiff, it's very posed. But here, you know, it's really a sense of us trying to figure out what is going on. You know, why is there a dog there? What is the artist doing? All these sort of different things. So I think that's really interesting. OK, I think I need to move on, but let me just see. Um, yes, so. I think what none of you and I'm going to do it like this so you can better see it, but I think what is interesting with this one and none of you, well, one of you noticed that there was a mirror in the background with two people. So just above the girl's head we see a mirror where two people are reflected in, right? And I can tell you that that's a king and the queen. So the little girl's uh, parents. And what is interesting is that they're being reflected in the mirror. And for them being able to be there, right? They must be in our position as viewers. So, they're in the position that we're in as viewers because they're being reflected in the mirror on the back wall. And so that means that the artist is actually painting them, right? They're standing in front it, with us and being painted by the artist in the painting who also made the painting. I hope this makes sense. Otherwise, put it in the chat if not. So, the king and the queen are there, but they're not really there, right? But what's interesting about this is that the artist, who was a royal court painter, that means that his job was to paint royal, the royal family, and he got paid for it. And, you know, he had his job was to make the royal family look as good as they could. So that was his job. What's interesting is that he's decided to put the king and the queen in the same position as us viewers, right? And the viewers could be anybody. So there's something about maybe that we as viewers are the king and the queen. Could that be? What do you guys think that he's trying to say with this? Because it's, it's a bit complicated, right? One of you said all these different ways of looking. This is another, another different kind of way that's being looked upon, right? That we're occupying the space of the king and the queen who are reflecting in the mirror while we, the king and the queen, are being painted by him. Does this make sense? It's a bit of a complicated one, but I think it's really interesting. Let me know. I can't see if any of you are in the chat, but I think Oh, there we go. Uh, no, but I think um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, 
Yeah, so someone is saying, I was wondering if the portrayal of the king and queen in the mirror in the back shows that they're distant from the other people in the painting. Yeah, definitely, right? There is the that there is the physical sort of like distance, right? Like when we're looking at the painting, they're far away from us, right? They're in a bit of a blurred mirror. They're still, you know, the head of state. There is still the king and the queen at this point. But somehow the artist has still decided to put him, put them in the back, which is really interesting. So definitely. And they're different from the other people in the painting. Yeah, there is a physical distance built into it. I think that's completely true. Um, someone is saying that the king and the queen are equal to us to suggest that the royalty are equal to their subjects. Yeah, I think that's a really good interpretation, really good analysis in terms of the artist is really doing something very different here in terms of that he is allowing the viewer, whoever that might be, a commoner, to have the same view as the king and the queen, looking out at their uh, princess, looking at this sort of very busy seeing, busy scene, and we have the same view as them, and that makes us equal. Um, someone is saying, maybe it's supposed to make us feel like royal and like we are on par with royalty. I certainly feel like a king looking at this. Okay, well, that's good. Then the artists have done something right in terms of making the viewer feeling like we're part of the scene, right? I think even that little sort of space in the foreground in front of the girl really allows us to step into the scene of feeling a part of it. I think that's true. And making us feel like royalty. Yeah, which is really, I think it's quite controversial for a royal court painter to do that. Um, let me see. Uh, someone is saying, very interesting, like they're being brought down to the level or being brought up to theirs. Yes. I think that's true as well. Uh, makes social status and chain of being meaningless. That's true too. Really good interpretations. The king and queen are just people as well, like us. Yeah, completely true. I think... All really good interpretations in terms of taking something that's happening in the painting and making. Okay, well, the artist is trying to say something here about social status, about the position of the king and the queen. Maybe it's a bit rocky. Maybe he's trying to show the importance of the subjects of the commoner, um, which is really interesting. Um, yes. Okay, I think we'll move on now. But this was really good. We have another one to go and we still want a bit of time for questions. So, but thank you for all your questions, for all your comments. Um, you're really good at this. Okay, so this is a different kind of painting. It's not even a painting, I'm wrong. It's a collage. Um, and again, we just start with purely observation. Tell me what it is that you're seeing. And there's, again, no right answer. Just tell me what we're looking at. Someone is saying a guitar man. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's spotted right there in the foreground, in the left foreground, we have a guitar man. So a guy who's playing the guitar. Someone is saying it's abstract. I think that's true too. It's a completely different kind of painting than what we saw before, right? In terms of that it feels much more constructed in some way. It appears to be a house. Yes, yeah, so we're inside of a house. Um, okay, you're very quick. Um, very colorful, less sense of depth than perspective. Okay, great. Someone knows about depth, someone knows about perspective. There's a less sense of, right, it's not clear. The space is more flat in some ways. And that's definitely a conscious choice. Um, there's the wine. Yes, that's correct too. Someone lying on a couch, maybe a musician. Yes, okay, that's a really good comment. So why could that be a musician? Because we have a guitar man on the left as well. Yeah, um, I think that's a good claim to, to make. Someone sleeping on the couch. Yes. 
Someone's saying it's very cold. That I don't know about. But um, yeah, if that's a vibe you're getting. A dancing woman. Yes, yeah, so we have in the right background, we have the silhouette of the forms of a woman. Yeah, very good. Maybe that then goes with the guitar man. Uh, someone is saying colors are very bright and it's very busy. Maybe reflects mindset of a person feeling crazy. Yes, okay. So I completely agree this thing about it's very busy, right? And I think that's both in the scene itself, but also the way it's been constructed. And the colors are very bright. Completely true. So it's very different from what we looked at before, right? Um... Woman crying on the bed and drinking alcohol. Yeah, okay. What makes you say that she's crying? Um, I'm not saying it's not right. I'm just saying what gives away some, there's something that gives something away in her body language. Um, alcohol on the table. Some of the pieces are plain paper. Some are specific photographs. Is the artist trying to show something through this or is it just for more detail? Really good question. So this is completely right. So. This is, you know, a collage, right? And you might have done a collage at home, but it's basically where you have different kinds of paper and you glue them on top of each other, you layer them. Often you do this through popular culture sort of materials, so like magazines and things like that. And I think he's definitely trying to show something through this. Um, both to add more detail, I, I think that's part of it, but I also think he's doing something very different in terms of, using different kinds of paper, like paper, photographs, uh, cutouts, uh, you know, different kinds of colors. He's using, he's doing that with intention, I think, that we can definitely say. The question is what? But I think he's definitely trying to do something through this. It's almost like cubism from Picasso. Okay, that's really good. So someone knows about cubism, someone knows about Picasso. Completely true. We'll see a bit later, actually, because I think you're completely right on that one. And cubism, you know, for all of you who don't know it, it's really, it's sort of what we call a movement or, yeah, a movement, a group of artists who is all very interested in deconstructing spaces. So one of the famous thing they did was that Picasso, he was, he really liked construct, deconstructing guitars. So really showing the shape of things, really trying to like take familiar shapes and re restructure them. Uh, there's a text at the bottom of the right uh, at the bottom right of the collage. What does it mean? That is actually just his name, the artist's name, Wormer Bearden. So that's just his signature. Um, but yeah, really good. He's put it very differently than what normal artists or what other artists have done. Um, it appears to show the average day of the three people in this piece of art. Really true. So again, we have a sense of we're coming into a sort of everyday, behind the scenes, very normal, uh, everyday scene, domestic scene in a living room, right? Great. It's not, it's not, you know, is not the pose of the royal family. It's very down to earth. The use of colors in the background stands out against the person in black seem quite, uh, against the black, against the person in black seem seeming quite distressed. Yes, so that's really good. So lots of you have pointed out with the colors because also they were so different from what we saw before. Completely true. This blacked out space that we have of the woman on the sofa and the silhouette in the back are really in stark contrast to the colors surrounding them, right? And it's further enhances almost their blackness. There's a cat, uh, really true. There are no windows. I think maybe above the couch that could be a window, but I think it's, a, it's up to interpretation, to be honest. I think that's true. And I think that's what he does. He makes us sort of question what it is that we're seeing. Um, with the guitars black, but got hands that are white. Ah, oh, that is a really good detail to notice. Yes, 
So again, speaking to the medium of the collage, but maybe also trying to say something bigger. Um, family painting in the background. Yeah, really good. A quiet place for people to socialize and feel comfortable. Yes, two of you have said that there are cats. That's true. They're quite cute. Uh, maybe their family died and they're coping with grief. Yeah, that's a good interpretation. Then we have to think about why do we think that? What set? What is there a sense of grief in this painting? The woman's drunk, so like she's sleeping because she's drunk. Yeah, that is another interpretation, right? So there's lots of different ways of interpreting this collage. Um, maybe the music can help them stimulate as they are all in their own worlds. Yeah. That's true. And someone is, uh, all of them are wearing something on their heads, which is really true. It connects them. Yeah. Um, this collage with the vibrant color and separate image gives the view of person's mind influenced by substance like alcohol. Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. So even in the medium itself, there is a sense of being maybe disorientated by alcohol. I think that's, that, that's a good claim to make. I think you can definitely do that. So, this is a very interesting collage, I think. So, um, and I've not told you too much about it, but you already picked out lots of different things, right? We picked out the colors, we picked out the figures, the guitar man, the woman lying down, the woman in the background. We picked out the cats, we picked out the alcohol, the family painting. We picked out the medium itself in terms of it's very deconstructed. Super good. So you're really good at looking at these things. Another thing, of course, is to say, OK, Roma, now I can then say, well, Roma Baradin, he was an African-American artist who worked uh, as part of what we call the Harlem Renaissance, um, which was sort of um, existing alongside the civil rights movement in America. Some of you might have heard of it. This is made in 1968, which was sort of on the back of, or at the end of the civil rights movement. So in this one, he's definitely playing with that, right? We're seeing a domestic scene, as some of you are saying, with black figures. We're seeing the subject as being black, as being, um, you know, the main subject of an artwork, which is quite unusual as well. We have to remember through art history. And Bearden was someone who was very interested in art history himself. And throughout his work, he keeps referencing other kinds of art that's been made. So, so what he, for example, was interested in here, also what we see in the title with called Black Venus, right? He is referencing earlier paintings of art where there is a Venus figure. The Venus is, you know, some of you might know as a Roman goddess, um, sort of known for her fertility, known for her love, a symbol of desire, all these sort of things, often portrayed as white. Whereas in this one, he's making her black, right? And he's really responding to you. Someone said Picasso and Cubism. Yes, that's true. And I even included the guitar man by Picasso down here because I think he's really speaking into that and he is reinterpreting all these white sources to create a new kind of vision of black life and what that might look like and how to reclaim that. Um, so it's a really interesting collage. Some of you are saying it's a collage, it is. At a moment where the where blackness was really being reclaimed and the rights of blackness was completely at the forefront politically, socially, culturally, on all levels in American society. And Roma Baradin was really participating in that through his art, I think, um, which is really interesting and not something that you can immediately read from the collage, right? This is where we're drawing on other, other sources and think about, well, what time did this exist in? Um, yeah, OK, really good. I hope you found that interesting. Um, that was sort of the visual analysis. Then I'll just run quickly through the other things that you'll learn as an art historian. So 
another thing that and you might sort of be starting to do this as well in your school is using evidence and thinking critically about this evidence, right? So as an art historian, we don't only look at art objects, but we also look at it could be speeches or it could be documents or it could be um, other kind of art or it could be um, statistics. It could be all kinds of documents, right? Primary sources of any kind, also secondary sources. Um, and what we do is that we think critically about them. So why you see four windows is because we think of a source as a window. So a source gives you a very particular view on the world, right? You can't see to the right, you can't see to the left, but you can see the view that's being provided by the window. And our job as art historians is to think about, okay, well, how does this window look? Why does our view look like this? And what can we not see? Who is talking and who is not talking in this source? And that's what we're doing a lot in History of Art. Um, with art objects themselves, but also with other kinds of textual uh, uh, sources. Um, so yeah, being having a really critical um, mind in terms of when we're reading sources is a very critical skill. Then another one is learning concepts of terms about history. So with other disciplines, you have a vocabulary that you learn, right? Art historians have the same. Some of you said something about foreground and background. One of you mentioned perspective. All these sort of things is concepts and terms that we art historians use all the time to sort of know what we're talking about when we talk with each other. Um, so something like still life, impasto, that basically means like the thickness of paint. Um, yes, writing about art. So that's another one that as an art historian, we don't just talk about it, right? Like, like we've done today. A really key skill is to write about it. And it's something if you do it at university, you'll be writing a lot. And I think art history specifically is very important in terms of you have a very visual experience and a very personal experience with an artwork and you have to put that into writing which can be quite difficult, I think. So by the end of it, you will be really good at writing about all sorts, to be honest, um, just because throughout you have to keep being really good at writing and writing very, so the reader understands what it is that they're looking at. Um, yeah, so that was sort of just a bit quickly about other skills you might learn as an art historian or what kind of skills we use as an art historian. Then there's different choices here. You might know some of them, but if you're interested in more history of art kind of things, I would definitely, you know, some, something like YouTube is really good. Lots of the big museums, the National Gallery, the Tate Gallery, um, the Met Museum, they all have really good YouTube channels. So it's quite fun to see what they get up to. Often you get it behind the scenes. If you need to, you know, actually, if you want to read something, access store, Access Store Research is a good one, or JSTOR. Um, and um, they're really good just to get information if you want them. It's all free. Um, and then there's different kind of podcasts. I don't know if you guys are on the podcast sort of uh, trend or not, but they might have, they have some really good art podcasts, which can be quite easy and quite sort of um, just like a good way to get information. YouTube, I think if I've not convinced you about um, what art history is or why it matters, specifically at a time where art history is really disappearing from schools, the Courtauld had done a really good YouTube series about why it matters. Um, so definitely check that out. You can see more about history of art at Oxford if that's something you're interested in. Or yeah, as I said, the Met YouTube is really good too. Something else is I just want to flag up is Art History Link Up. Uh, if any of you is interested in taking art history at an A level, but don't have it in as part of your school, Art History Link Up is a nationwide charity that uh, you can sign up for and you can go into museums and you can basically have art history at an A level. It's a great charity. I can definitely recommend. Uh, they do so much great stuff. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in pursuing that further, I would have a look. But um, yeah, and now we have the question round and we have three minutes. So I know one of you asked me about um, 
what job do, can you even get with an art history degree? And I think that's one that we get a lot. And I think, uh, as with other humanities degree does, um, you can do so many things without history. You can do into, you can go into the whole art world, to be honest. So working at auction houses, working at museums, working at galleries, art writing, art magazines, but you also have, you can go into academia, uh, but you also have the whole cultural sector, which is, you know, very big, you know, it's 6% of the economy or something. So it's a massive, a massive uh, sector you can go into and be a part of anything from marketing, PR, um, communications, really people with an art history degree goes those sorts of places. Um, there's also some people who go into consulting afterwards or do something completely different because the skills that you get as an art historian is still really valuable because you learn to be a really good researcher and you learn to think for yourself and take your own opinion seriously. Um, yes. Is there any other questions for me? Uh, oh, yes, this one I actually saw in the chat. I'm sorry I didn't uh, immediately answer. Do art historians also try to predict uh, what future, what the future art might look like from how art has changed over time? Yes. So I think that's a really good question. And I think some art historians do, right? We are always thinking about how art might change, um, how it might change in the future. I think that's a really good point. And yes, I think about whether we're predicting it or not. That's a good question. I don't think art historians spend too much time predicting, but we're definitely looking at contemporary art and following it very closely, right? And see what's going on. Predicting it, predicting it would require us to think a lot about, well, technolo technology and all these sort of things. And also it's very up to the individual artists, I assume. So it's a hard one to predict because art can go all sorts of places, I think. But yeah, I think we definitely think about it on a theoretical level. Um, and um, yeah, but that's actually a good question. And I think often we think about, well, why does this art look the way it looks compared to the past art? So we always think about how things have developed in relation to what went before. So we do that too with contemporary art. Um, yeah, I hope that made sense. It's a really good question. Anything else? I think we're just about out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, we Elena, are. But thank you so much for that fascinating session. And just for students who did want to follow up on those links, um, your school will get a copy of this Great. recording. So you will be able to see some of those resources, the podcast, the links to online museum resources, etc. But that was fascinating. So next week we are back for maths and graph theory. So thank you very much, oh, Elena. That's quite different. <laughs> very different. And thank you to the audience for some great um, skills in visual analysis and interpretation. See you all next week. Thank you. You're all really great. Thank you so much. Thanks for um, sharing this hour with me.